is job hunting after your B.Ed. or job hunting after teacher's college. Uh, I myself, I'm Colin Pierce. I am um, a graduate of Alt House just last year. So um, Alt House B.Ed. 2020. Um, and I was able to land OT and LTO positions. So I'm here to just let you know what the whole process is. It's going to be thinking about uh, how you're gonna apply to these jobs, how you're gonna network, how you're gonna communicate with the school boards, what do the school boards want? Um, we can even touch on AQs. I'll, I'll get into maybe LTOs. It's never too soon to start thinking about LTOs. Um, and everything just related to the whole job hunting process we're gonna go through today as well, along with everything that I've gone through myself, it's gonna be very anecdotal. And also we're going to do actually, um, I'm gonna keep it a little bit interactive. So um, I might have some questions here or there that I'll ask um, some people if they'd want to take a stab at an interview question. Uh, that will be another part of my presentation. So um, if you're willing and if you wanna um, ans answer any of the questions that I've heard myself in a lot of uh, interviews being an OT. I would highly recommend you just put your hand up through Zoom settings. I think all of us by now know how to do that. And then um, we can have a little interactive fun game trying to figure out all these fun questions that principals like to ask us. So let's, let me just introduce myself a little bit further. So who am I? My name is Colin Pierce, uh, Western Faculty of Education graduate 2020. Um, right now, I just landed, well, as of September, I landed an LTO uh, at John F. Ross Collegiate and Vocational Institute. This is in Guelph, Ontario, part of the Upper Grand District School Board. Uh, I am an intermediate senior teachable. Uh, that doesn't mean anything that I mentioned here relating to primary juniors or junior intermediates won't be relevant. It absolutely will. Do not worry. Uh, my teachables normally are biology and general science. However, I did pick up some two additional additional qualifications as well in senior chemistry and senior business as well. Um, during the question and answer period afterwards, I'd be happy to answer some questions about AQs if you if anyone has any one of those. Um, right now in my LCO, I'm teaching grade 12 chemistry and grade 10 academic science. Um, I've bounced over a few different courses now since I've been doing this LTO since September, um, but mostly in the science areas, um, obviously where I've been. And also just a little fun fact about me, some stuff that I like to do on the side. I'm an instructor at a group called CSberg, where we do synthetic biology education. So if you'd like to ask me about that, maybe afterwards, I'd be happy to answer any questions there too. So uh, this is me. <laughs> um, this is, I didn't have any logo or where for my school that I work at now, but it's my Ross logo there. Uh, this is me um, at Faculty of Education at Alt House for 2018 Chris, um, sorry, Halloween contest, and I was Regina George after she got hit by a bus. Uh, this is me as Taylor Swift, 2019 Halloween at Alt House, and this is me with the kitten. So nice to meet everyone. So job hunting, how does it start? Let's go through the process now. You are in your first year, maybe there's some second years here, that'd be awesome too. And you're thinking, what the heck do I do? How do I even approach becoming an OT? And it's good that you're thinking about this now and it's good that you all are here now because there is a lot for us to tackle and get ready for now so that when you get into your second year and you start applying, you'll have a good grasp of what to expect, how to approach where, where to apply to and, and who to talk to and all that fun stuff there. Fun, fair warning, I have a lot of memes in this presentation as I use a lot of memes when I teach. So uh, I am hired actually at five different school boards as an OT right now, Upper Grand District School Board, Thames Valley, Avon Maitland, Waterloo Region, and Toronto District School Board as well. Although I think I got kicked out of Toronto for not doing enough OT days there. Um, you may ask, hey Colin, why'd you apply to so many school boards? And uh, just a quick friendly recap of how 2020 went when I was applying to uh, all these OT positions. I was very uncertain about the future and whether I would even get a job or work anywhere. So I wanted to apply to as many places as possible due to the craziness that 2020 obviously was. So um, let's talk about how to market yourself to school boards now. Um, there's different ways that you can now communicate and talk to school boards. Obviously it's very different now uh, than it was when I went through the process pre-pandemic versus post-pandemic, but Hopefully there are still a lot of different avenues that are very similar that you can use and approach it. So for your resume, when you're creating your resume, I wanna talk about that first. Uh, and I'm actually gonna show mine as an example, along with my cover letter too. Um, go nuts. 
you may have had a talk with Bill Tucker already. Bill Tucker, bless his heart. I miss the man so much. Um, up to four pages, I would say is just fine. Bill Tucker would say, oh, go even further. I have as many pages as you want. I would say probably stop it at four. That's what I did. Um, but also, it's important to know that principals don't really look at your resume. It's not their top priority. It's not even their top three priorities when they're thinking about deciding to hire you as an OT. So keep that in mind. My, Tron my Thames Valley District School Board, they interviewed, they did not even ask for a resume. They didn't even want a resume. That's the reality sometimes that you have to understand and something that you have to prioritize as well when you're thinking about are we, what, what, how are we going to choose um, what to focus on and what do principals want to see out of us. So um, obviously your practical experiences should be on your first page. That is, um, I think, not really too surprising to think about. It's something that they want to see uh, if they even do look at your resume. Um, and I go through a little bit of what my resume looked like back then. Relating teaching experiences is a great heading to have after that. Other work experiences, that's really good too. I'm going to show you that when we go through my resume. Uh, and cover letters are a must. Uh, do, never, do not forget a cover letter, not even from the perspective that um, they're going to focus on your cover letter, they can read your cover letter or not, but it's important that you have your cover letter there because your cover letter shows that, that the effort has been put in and they want to make sure that people are putting a significant amount of effort in, um, in your resume and, and what you're submitting to them to take the school board seriously, essentially, right? Uh, my one... I'm gonna to touch on this again, but I'm gonna mention it twice because it's very, very important. Buzzwords, 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 buzzwords. Um, they're scrolling through so many different words you're saying, they're scrolling through so many different resumes of so many different people. They're looking for those short, sweet, pedagogical buzzwords that we're all learning through teachers, right? So culturally relevant pedagogy or UDI, all that fun stuff, you have to insert that, highlight it, underline it, make it pop out. That's what they're looking for. Okay. Um, part two. So when you're preparing your materials, that's what I've gone through now. Let's talk about the different ways in which you can reach out to potential employers. Job fairs, if they ever come back, uh, obviously there are virtual job fairs out there sometimes and hopefully post pandemic, you're going to find more of them, especially by the time that you start to um, apply to all these different positions next year. Fingers crossed, who knows what the heck it'll look like, but I'm gonna say that if you have the opportunity to go to a job fair, that's your number one method that I would say helps you get an OT position. Um, I drove all the way from London to Toronto to my first job fair when I was starting my second year teacher's college. Um, and that was during like my third practicum and I'm so glad I did because I have a little anecdote and a little fun story to tell you next about um, how that went, because getting an OT position is wild sometimes. And I'll have a fun talk about how that happened. So talk to as many principals as you can. Um, they're not that scary. Some of them are, but most of them are not. Um, if you can just get them to remember your face or remember a conversation that you had, reach out to some principals or some hiring principals, even cold email some of them that you know they're part of the hiring that you're able to look for uh, on some board websites or some school websites. Um, if you can just get administrators to recognize your name and have conversations with them without even um, without even having any motive, that's still going to put you miles ahead of anyone else that you know, okay? So talk to as many principals as you can. And I'm gonna talk about my anecdote on how talking with as many principals as you can actually got me the job. Uh, because the job that I have now, I wouldn't have got it if I didn't go through a lot of the networking steps that are important. Uh, apply to Ed. Obviously, a lot of you have heard of Apply to Ed, and I can't touch too, 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 too much on it. Um, you may be a little scared of the website, potentially not know how it works. It's pretty intuitive. Uh, make an account. You have to pay $12 per school board that you're applying to. A um, few things. Make sure that your school board actually posts on Apply to Ed. Some of the school boards that I know of, at least, they don't even like apply to ed or they won't even post anything on apply to ed. So do your research, talk to them and know how they like to apply. They want people to apply to their schools or their school board. Um, and some like TVDSB, 
they do. They do like apply to ed. I say half and half and half they like to go to job fairs and get people to sign up. But a school board like Avon Maitland, um, they go like purely on apply to ed and a school board like Toronto District School Board, they don't touch apply to ed. They have only internal hiring. So it's important to know these things and do your research to know how best these school boards talk. Um, but essentially you're just going to type in your school board's name and apply to ed and um, pay that $12 fee for um, hopefully applying to that school board. If indeed that's how they hire their OTs, and you're just going to look for those headings and then um, that's that. Sometimes you have application questions that you got to work through as well. Put the effort into those too. Um, put the effort into those. Um, that's my last point here. So a lot of the apply to ed applications, you do need to answer a few bullet questions. Water the Region District School Board has that. Um, don't spend an inordinate amount of time on it, but definitely put in enough effort that you can see that you really do want to work there. Um, okay, I have a little fun anecdote and story to tell everyone on how I got my first OT position. Um, I put together a little comic book sketch and I hope you enjoy it. So it was, I was at a job fair in Toronto and I had just talked to a principal. I went up to a principal at Upper Grand District School Board and I said, hey, I'm interested in working here. She said, great, we're hiring on the spot. You have an interview spot at 340, we want to see you. I was like, awesome. And I sat down and while I was waiting for my interview, I met another teacher candidate and I said, hi, my name's Colin, I'm from Western. She said, hi, let's call her Voldemort. And I'm from York University. I'm a teacher candidate from York. I was like, great, nice to meet you. And I said, I'm interviewing for Upper Grand District School Board. She said, me too. And I thought I was gonna make a new friend. Next, I said, my interview time is at 3.40. And she's like, oh, no kidding, mine's right after that. It's at four o'clock. But then we were sitting there and we were sitting there and we were sitting there and no one was calling on us to pick our interview time. And all of a sudden, 3.40 came, four o'clock came and he goes, I'm gonna check to make sure that they didn't forget about us. And I was like, Voldemort from York, really good. I like that, good proactive. That's a good idea. To which she steals my interview slot, which is the last time slot of the day, has the interview and then tells them to pack up and go home. Uh, and then said something along the lines of, there is no good or evil, there are only power in those who are too weak to seek it. And I almost didn't get an interview time slot and I had to beg for an interview and it went very poorly because I was flustered. But the moral of the story is I then went to the job fair afterwards after I obviously didn't get the position and I talked to the same principals and I networked them and they remembered me and I said, yeah, no, I didn't hear back from you. She said, oh, that's strange. After I built a good relationship with her, one day after I had that conversation after the job fair back at Western, I got the job. So moral of the story, your teacher candidates, don't trust them. And number two, talk to as many principals as you can. Okay. Interviews at every school board are very different. Obviously, I'm applied, I've, I'm on five different school boards right now. So um, I've seen quite a fair share of questions and have quite a fair share of differently formatted interviews. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break down in order of importance, what kinds of questions you should definitely look forward to, okay? So, um, there's always similar types of questions in every interview. So these are the questions that I think you should focus on practicing with each other, with yourselves, script your answers for these. It's very important that you have these scripted and written down and have something to say to these. So number one, why do you want to work at insert school board here? Number two, they always have that. And I can't say anything specific because every school board is different. That question is always, always, always in every single interview that I've had thus far. Number two, a standard classroom management question, okay? So-and-so is misbehaving, how do you deal with the situation? And for this, I highly recommend a progressive discipline answer, talking about all the different resources that you can act. So talk about your Bill Tucker, creative and learning, supporting and learning environments, strategies that you've learned, easy. Make sure you're, then you're talking about um, different resources that you can bring in, um, a guidance counselor, um, a department head, the parents, oh my gosh, the parents are the most important thing to bring in. Um, maybe a mental health nurse, if there's even more escalating problems, and then make sure you mention administration last, I will say. Uh, no administrator likes to be bugged constantly, so keep that in the back of your head. 
Number three, DI and UDI questions. So this can come in two formats. They can have just a straight up DI and UDI question and they're quite easy to see. Um, I don't think there's anything else to say there. Just make sure you prepare an answer to make sure it's inclusive and you're talking about different spec ed concepts and that kind of stuff. Or they can have a lot of questions formatted such that there's opportunity for you to sprinkle DI and UDI into a lot of your answers, which leads into another point that I'll get to again, but don't be afraid to repeat yourself. Number four, a social justice question. Um, most school boards these days, they're really gung-ho on um, being proactive, working on racism within their schools. This is just things that, again, you can see when you're researching, researching their school boards and you're looking at their mission statements. Um, it's gonna be important for you to know what they're focusing on in that given year or like a five year time period that they have. But many, many school boards right now, they're really trying to have a equitable racism, um, how do I even put it? Just like a program to put together to hopefully lower the amounts of racism within their school board essentially, right? Uh, assessment questions, I think we all saw this coming as well. Assessment questions, they can, range a whole bunch of different ways, but just hopefully you have strategies maybe on the triangulation of assessment or gosh, you know, um, different ways in order to evaluate and assess a student. You know, there's a lot of DI that you can sprinkle into there as well. Um, obviously assessment for as and of learning. If you do not have assessment for as and of learning memorized by now and then drilled and ingrained to your head, you best have that drilled into your head. Uh, write that down now if you're taking notes, I'll say. Uh, and a unit overview question. Um, some of them like to do this as well. So talk, talking about, hey, you're designing this unit right now for this teacher who's on leave. How are you going to put it all together? Um, starting from the curricular documents to learning goals, expectations, um, how to have DI in order to accommodate some of the students that have IAPs, stuff like that. That's what they're looking for. All right. Time for the interactive part now. Do we have, oh, sorry, no, not yet. Um, three, three points, three points. Um, these are my big three flashy things that I also would say to write down. I've said them already a little bit. Number one, don't be afraid to repeat yourself in your answers. You're supposed to. If you're saying uh, universal design for learning and differentiated instruction in every single one of your answers, good. Don't be afraid to do that. Number two, buzzwords. They're writing things down constantly. Your interviews, they're not even going to look at you because they're just writing your, down your answers and they're looking for the buzzwords that they're going to write down. So make sure you got a ton of those in your back pocket. Okay. Number three, uh, many people will interrupt your online interviews. So if COVID is still a potential thing and they're still doing online interviews as obviously they did for me, they have open Zoom and Google Hangout links. And if they're behind, that means the next person is logging on to that Zoom and Google Hangout and interrupting your interview, saying, I'm ready for my interview, and you're in the middle of your own interview. And you have to be able to be in a mindset to say, I'm not going to let this distract me. I'm going to be ready. I'm going to be focused. Um, and you're, you're still going to answer your question. Okay. So now, <clears throat> if people want to raise their hand on a Zoom right now and be ready to unmute themselves, I would be happy to try out some questions. Hi, Colin. Hello. Um, so obviously, um, we can think of some buzzwords ourselves uh, throughout our courses, but I was just wondering if you would be able to give us just a list uh, to get um, our, our thinking going. Oh, for sure. That's a great question, Brianna. Thank you. Um, I, th I think I said this one before. So culturally re relevant pedagogy is huge. Um, that's good for racism and social justice and equity questions to think about culturally, re uh, culturally relevant pedagogy. Uh, super, super big one. Um, gosh, what are ones, if you're just talking about, if they have initiatives with raising math scores or raising literacy scores, do a little bit of research within their website and say some of those buzzwords that are on, on their website there. Um, yeah, you're putting me on the spot here. What are some of the ones that I like to use? Oh. I guess we can also open this up to everybody else in the meeting as yeah. well. Um, everyone, like, I don't know what your expectations were before, but throw things in the chat. 
like if you've got um, let's make this let's make this interactive. Like I'm so ready to have that happen. UDL UDI instruct understanding by design. Ooh, backwards design of learning. Everyone huge. They if you're getting a unit design overview, say backwards design of learning. Flipped classrooms, love it. Social emotional learning, love it. Yes, thank you for participating. I'm, I feel like I'm talking to a brick wall, you know? I know at least the IS people will know what it's like if you've had a practicum and you're just talking to a screen. Um, good Lord. Well, and if I may, um, just a quick question. You were talking about assessment. You were talking about DI triangulation of assessment. And there was one thing you said you wanted to make sure we had memorized. What was mm -hmm. that thing you said? Um, assessment for as and of learning. As and of learning, perfect, thank you. Yeah, I'll type that into the chat too. For as of learning. I love these, everyone, awesome job. Loving it, loving it. Flipped classroom, inclusion. Um, understanding synergy. <laughs> I, un I, un I unironically use synergy and synergistic as often as I can. I love it, Sam. Um, five E models, not my favorite lesson plan, but some people love it. And if that works for you, that's good. Inquiry-based learning. Uh, explicit instruction, literacy. Oh my God, growing success and learning for all. Just, just read it. Read it before you go to bed. Growing success and learning for all documents. Have that under your pillow. Coding, oh, I love it. Someone's in the um, STEM specialization. Guided, shared, independent learning, self-regulation. Yeah, so just be your math, love it. Um, I think everyone can get the idea here that you guys obviously you've learned the terms like you've you've gone through a year of teachers college pretty much already right you know you know that you know the buzzwords just what i'm telling you is to format those buzzwords and make sure that you're saying them at appropriate times throughout the interview so that the person who's writing down your answer knows how to pick it right out because that's what they're going to be writing down and if you're just saying a really long and thoughtful and awesome answer that maybe represents a lot of these buzzwords that you're saying right now, but you're not saying explicitly those buzzwords. It sounds kind of shallow to say, but it's not going to matter as much because they're going to be jumbled around trying to write down what trying to answer you're trying to say when it could be succinctly summarized within this buzzword. And they know exactly when they're reviewing their notes later. Ah, they said balanced literacy. They said cross-curricular learning. And they're like, haha, that's I like I liked when they said that because it's easy for them to write down. So this has been happening in every single one of my interviews that I see. So keep that in the back of your mind. Um, and thanks for, thanks for, I know, sorry, Katie, if you wanted to say all of them mute, but I like the interactiveness of this. So feel free to, yeah, just interject if you need to. Oh, but, no worries. Whatever works best for you. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. Love it. So uh, does anyone want to tackle these three questions that I have? You know what? I was going to say you can raise your hand or you can just unmute and say, I want to try a question. Just a quick comment. You can export that chat with all the buzzwords. Oh, yes, absolutely. Ha have that for everyone to look at. Um, and we can send this an email. And by the way, I'll have this presentation sent to everyone too if you want to take a look at it. Thanks, Justin. Any brave souls? Come on, there's 210 of you. Someone wants to do a question. Maybe call in like people would feel more comfortable if they just answered once the question was presented, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> okay. I was trying to, I had it formatted such that like, this is how it I'll do it, Colin. Maybe. Thanks, Julia. Someone's going to see Julia ace it and then be like, ah, oh, no, I can I'm do it. I'm not going to ace it, but other Julia gave me courage, you know? I like the courage. I love it. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Question number one. You are teaching a grade seven math class when you hear a student shout a racial slur to another student of color. How do you handle this situation? Um, I think the first thing that I would do uh, would be de-escalating the situation. Um, big thing I like to focus on is calling in versus calling out. So taking the opportunity to educate the student versus making that student feel that they are being put on the spot or being attacked in any way. Um, so, you know, taking the opportunity to maybe pull that student aside and be like, hey, like, 
I recognize that, you know, this is the term that you used. I want to make sure that you understand the connotation or the meaning behind uh, that word that you use. This is what it means. This is how it can be interpreted. Um, I wanted to take the opportunity to educate you on that and make you un like, you know, take the opportunity to tell you that that isn't something that's appropriate or welcome in the classroom. Um, I think calling in versus calling out is a huge thing that um, is really important in education and also with our peers as well because it helps us to make people feel empowered and educated versus um, making them feel attacked or um, that they aren't you know smart enough to understand these things so I feel like for students um, this would be an approach that I would take um, from a classroom management perspective I also feel like you would also want to make sure that this isn't something that's condoned in the classroom. So instead of maybe uh, singling that individual out, you know, taking the opportunity to uh, recap with the class on what our uh, standards and, uh, you know, rules and respect are for the classroom, you know, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, um, and just having that open dialogue to make sure that, you know, everybody's feeling included and respected and we're not using um, words that can be uh, offensive to individuals in the classroom. Oh my gosh, guys, can we all give an amazing applause to Julie's awesome answer? That was phenomenal. Hired on the spot. Right? Well done. That was awesome. Loved it. Loved it. So, Julie, I, I love that you brought that opportunity back to the classroom to make it like an educational moment. I love the way you, you ended your answer. It was perfect. Thank you. Super, super great. Um, there's not many things I can, I can really say. Uh, that it was phenomenally done. Um, one thing I, I shall say is to recognize the format of the question when it's proposed to you. Um, what I would say is this is a two part question in terms of my seven things that I broke down. Part of it's a social justice and equity problem in which you just nailed. And the part, other part would be, um, it's also a classroom management problem as well. So. Um, you could potentially talk about uh, integrating different resources as well that you, that you can bring in, talking to the parents, making sure that... So like the follow-up that would come with that as well. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, just integra integrating that part of it really thinking beyond the four walls of the classroom. So basically well. like taking the different aspects of um, whatever the question is and then rolling with it, even if they don't necessarily want to hear about it, you're going to just kind of, you know, sell yourself on all the different areas. Kind of yeah, unfortunately, that's that's kind of the um, that's kind of the the commercialization of these interviews at all. You're selling yeah, yourself, no. right? Yeah, yeah. You're, um, you're selling yourself, and you need to. They have check boxes that they're trying to check off, and okay. um, you had literally the best answer I have heard to that question. I'm not even exaggerating. Well, thank just, you. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's just important to keep in the back of your mind that um, you're formatting it in such that the way that they're recording it down on their sheet and making sure they're checking off all their boxes and what they're looking for. Because, awesome. Thank you. yeah, yeah. So good, awesome. That was my hardest question by far. I have two more and the other two are like light years simpler than those. I don't know why I started with the hardest one. Uh, like we said before, I'll see the sec, I'll show you the second question. So this one is going to be uh, a unit planning question. By the way, these are all questions that have been in OT interviews. Uh, I will not say which ones because of legality issues, but I just want to let you know that I'm not just making these up. These are actual OT interview questions. So um, this one's all about unit planning. So how do you go about assessment evaluation? And finally, how do you cater to different student needs? Anyone can unmute or I can just talk about it. I don't mind either way. You could probably talk about the backwards design for uh, learning here and just start um, talking through those steps. Absolutely. Backwards design of learning, I'd say, is the biggest buzzword in this question. And that's the one that you're, you're going to want to say. And that's the one that they're going to write down and check off that checkbox. Because like I said, the way they format these interviews, it's all about saying the buzzwords that check off a checkbox on their sheet. Could it also another one be performing a diagnostics to see where the students learning are at that point before Absolutely. starting to listen? 
Absolutely. This is an assessment question. So I need to hear from everyone here. Assessment for as and of learning. For get those diagnostics in. I love that, uh, Justin, right there. Um, evaluation is obviously going to be of learning, and you're going to have that metacognition with assessment um, as learning as well. Hey, if people want to message in the chat, I love that too. Could you also use like choice boards, like making sure you're like as an assessment tool, like using choice boards so students have um, different outlets to be successful in how Love it. Love the multimedia literacy of that in terms of, and that also I think caters to a lot of, um, the last part of the question, catering to different student needs. Um, you're having the DI such that if students really thrive from that, that's going to be very accessible to them. And that's obviously UDL as well, necessary for some, beneficial for all. Saying those things, they love to hear it in the interviews. Um, but yeah, having the media itself, that a good example of how to portray this, like what you just said, Sarah, that's awesome. Incorporating DI into discussion, catering students needs from Lexi, love it. Absolutely, that's what they're looking for here. Some things that I would talk about, I wouldn't word it like this for an interview, but things that I'd point on is, when it comes to unit planning, check in with your own long range plan, see if you're on track for the year, if the kids are behind, if you need to spend more time on something else, how can you compensate? Um, consult with your colleagues that are teaching the same grades, what are they doing, what are their ideas, so that you have that community aspect involved. If you're an OT and you're just picking up the class for however long, um, consult with the teacher that previously taught and see where, they, where the students were based off that and how they did. Um, so that you're kind of going in sequence and you're not necessarily starting off on something that the students don't have even a little bit of prior knowledge for. Um, in terms of assessment and evaluation, I would want to make my plan for assessment evaluation at the beginning. So as for of learning, but then involve the students at the beginning, get them to co-construct the criteria with you, ask them how they feel they should be assessed. If it's in um, plan with what you were thinking of designing, then go ahead and then you can start to make those criteria together so that upfront the students know exactly what to expect throughout the unit and they know how they're going to be graded at the end. And then when it comes to different student needs, that's especially your um, differentiation. So setting the low floor, the high ceiling, but then on top of that reviewing to make sure that you've hit on any accommodations and modifications that you have for your own classroom. Madison, there's so much to unpack there and I actually don't have time for it, but love it. Love everything that you said there. I, I, to sum it up, at least one thing that I heard from there, I love how you're thinking outside the box and really utilizing the different resources that you have access to. That's super important and that's something that I love to hear. But you answered each part of that question in exactly the way that I think they would love to hear it. So that's good. Um, one, I know I have to be cognizant of time right now and I think I still will finish on time. Um, by the way, great answers, everyone. I love what everyone's saying here, and I can't message all of it, but um, Leah sent me a direct message, which I just wanna actually talk about for one second. These are a lot of words. They will always give you a printed out sheet of paper if you're doing this in person for you to see this question, or they will leave it up on a screen pinned if it's a virtual interview as well. They do their own DI to make sure that they have different modes for you to read or verbally hear these questions too. So don't worry if, if you think they're just gonna say this question to you and you're, you have to memorize it. You'll always be able to read and see these questions too, just like you're doing right now. Um, and what everyone's talking about up here, awesome. When we export the chat, you'll, you'll see um, a lot of the really good things that people are saying and a lot of their buzzwords. Um, quickly now, because I have to be cognizant of time, my last question is very simply, how do you support equity and inclusion in the classroom? Heard this one multiple times in an interview. Just quickly spout off some ideas and we can move on because we've been doing, saying so many good things. Integrate in curriculum, absolutely. Representation of resources, yeah. Making an effort to ensure that your students see themselves represented in the curriculum material and in their environment in the school community. Absolutely. I love the, going outside your classroom, like Bill Tucker talks about, beyond the four walls of the classroom, insert yourself into their community. Starting teaching, what are we seeing here? Community members, experts, invite into the class. Absolutely. For indig like indigenous um, and Aboriginal education, bring in elders, absolutely. Starting teaching early in the year, treat others the way they want to be treated, absolutely. Classroom, contract, treating everyone the same. Yeah, like 
everything that you know about UDL just regurgitate in this answer is honestly what they're looking for. And then with a few good examples of what like you guys are talking about right now. That's what that's how I would approach this question. Role model equitable behavior. Yeah. Encouraging integration in the classroom for students, special education class, mainstream. Yeah, really good things, everyone. So everyone's pretty much summarizing what I just said right now. So just to summarize again for this question, regurgitate UDL, give it really good examples of it is how to summarize this question in Coles Notes version. Any questions about those three questions before I finish things off now? Sorry, did you say that these, uh, like everything in the chat too will be um, available to us as well? Like we'll be able to export it somehow? Uh, I, have, I have exported Zoom chats before and if I made a host, I can do that, so. Um, well, I think you can just, if you open the chat, there's the three little dots there, you click that and it says save chat and it just saves it to a text file, so. Oh, oh. very cool, awesome, thank you. Nice, so all of us can do it. Oh, nice. Yay. <laughs> Sweet. Learning new things about Zoom a year later into using it. Okay. <laughs> uh, we're still having a lot of good answers here. Design a barrier-free classroom, involve parents, communicate these expectations well to them. Love it. All right, I do wanna finish on time to make sure that everyone uh, can ask questions. By the way, I will stay here past six to answer questions because I know there's a lot of you and I know a lot of you have a lot of questions and I do have some free time. So I know this goes until six, but I will answer every single one of your questions, okay? So congratulations, you just got an OT position. Now what? Let's talk through just the logistics of what's gonna happen now too. I know this is called job hunting after teacher's college, but after you have job hunted, what are you going to expect now? Well, forms, forms everywhere is, is the short of it. You're gonna make sure that you have, um, your OCT number available and your certificate, direct repository information, ability and willpower to fill out tax forms, T4s, all those, and even more police checks, even more ones that you already have submitted. Uh, here's an example of a checklist that I screenshotted from TVDSB when they hired me. So you're looking for your OCT. They have forms about your pension that you're gonna have, earning deposit instructions, that kind of stuff, tax credit returns, a lot of tax forms. Um, obviously your police check, a lot of WMIS. Uh, something to add on to here is so many COVID forms as well. They have an unbelievable amount of COVID forms now too. So have fun with those. A lot of safety stuff. And then, yeah. I would like to talk to you about something called Smart Find Express right now. And this is how you get called as a substitute teacher as an OT. Um, essentially you set up an account through your phone. You just enter a code. Um, you record your name. Hi, I'm Colin Pierce. And then that's what comes up to them when they're, um, they're calling you for a substitute teaching position. And uh, you set up a passcode, what days you're el eligible to work. You can do that on your phone or you can do it logged in on the Smart Find Express website. Uh, and fun fact, they called me 39 times my first night I set it up. That's not a joke. Um, here's a screenshot of every single call that was called to me on Smart Find Express. Uh, so yes, that leads into my next point. There are a ton of jobs right now uh, in the COVID uncertainty. They are hiring like crazy, but also uh, a lot of the aging population is retiring now, which means um, there's an unbelievable amount of openings right now. And there's not one person that I know that isn't working full time as an OT. And about half the people that I know that have gotten hired as OTs are now in LTOs. So, like, this is great. It's a great time to go into the profession. I know with a lot of uncertainty, there's a caveat to that, but I say don't fret. So um, make sure, is that just Guelph or is it every board you applied for? So I got friends all over the place that have graduated from Alt House and or most boards, I think in Ontario and that's across the board. That's everyone. Um, I'd say the more, Toronto-esque you get, I think it's a little bit harder. And obviously the more rural you get, it's a lot easier. But if you're talking about a suburban school board like TVDSB here in London or Guelph or Waterloo, um, you're, you're golden. 
those ones are definitely, they're hiring like crazy right now. All right, I'm all over the place here. I wanna make sure I finish on time. I'm almost done. I know it's 5.40 right now. I should open up for questions soon. So I'll get through these last couple slides. So they call 6 to 9 p.m. at night, sometimes in the morning if it's an emergency, but that's your window in which you definitely need to have your phone on. Um, always, my advice is always, always, always going to the office and talk to your VP and introduce yourself each day as a supply teacher. I cannot stress that enough. Uh, that's how you get LTOs in the future is you get them to hear your names because you always need three references from administration, a VP or a principal in order to get an LTO position. So make those connections, network, network, network. Um, make sure you have back pocket activities ready to go if you have no less, if there's no lesson plan delivered to you because that happens more than you think. And there's nothing worse than being delivered into um, a, a classroom with no lesson plan to go. And always leave notes for the teacher when you're done just letting them know a comprehensive saying what you did. You'd be surprised how many OTs don't leave notes. Uh, it's terrifying. All right, Regulation 274, I wanna to touch on this. You may have heard this as well. So Stephen Lecce, Doug Ford's government said, hey, we're taking away that seniority and now anyone can apply to an LTO or, an, um, or a contract position and seniority doesn't matter at all. Well, not really, or at least not yet, is what I'll say. Uh, since I have the insider scoop and I'm seeing how they're doing the LTO hiring now, it's not really true. They're still doing the old way and the unions still have power to only pick those top five people that Regulation 274 introduced, saying um, you have to make your way up the seniority ladder so everyone gets a number based on how long you've been with the board and um, the top five people within a certain number range, they're the only ones that can still get interviewed to this point. So Stephen Lecce, um, he is touting this. This is a very political stunt right now, saying anyone can get hired at any time. I'm here to tell you for now, that's not the case. Uh, they're kind of between the rule right now. So just keep that in mind too, um, for when you're applying to LTOs eventually. Um, mine is a very COVID specific LTO, uh, so they made an exception there, so yeah. So once you are an LTO, this is my last slide here, um, make sure you know when the LTO hiring periods are when you're an OT, so they happen twice a year, hopefully in every school board. Um, LTOs hire usually internally, so I would say 80% will hire internally, 20% will hire and apply to ed. If you see a whole bunch of LTO postings on apply to ed, guess what, there's a bajillion more that are just internally within your school board. Um, and then last one, once you're hired as an LTO, uh, you will now be on the LTO list, which is different from an OT list. So regulation 274 also splits those into two different lists now, okay? Uh, and here's my favorite meme that I made. Uh, this is me looking at LTO positions after you just get an OT position that you were offered. All right, that was so much fun. Thank you so much for everyone. I am here for questions till the end of time until I answer every single one of your questions right now. So fire away while I open up the text box right now. Colin, somebody had a great question in the chat box. Like what sort of activities would you suggest um, a first year teacher have in their back pocket just in case there's no lesson plans? Okay, first off, the first thing you do when there's no lesson plan is you call someone. Um, you still have eyes on the school, but use the phone to call if you have a department head, that's probably the best person to call because they will definitely get a lesson plan for you. Um, maybe administration will help, but best not to bug administration. Different back pocket activities I have. Uh, I have one specifically, that's my favorite one, where they try to draw a box with a triangle on top that kind of looks like a house and an X in the middle of the box without lifting their pencil and you can't go over the same line twice. Um, it's impossible and they get so into it. And um, that's actually, <laughs> it's my favorite one because it keeps them busy. And then that's the time when you get to call them, call the, um, the OT or the, sorry, the department head usually is the best person to call or another teacher in your department and they'll get together a lesson plan for you. Um, because, Are you talking about that sorry, box? go ahead the box with the triangle on top and the X in the square? Yes, it's my favorite one. That's doable. Really? Yeah, yeah it's not impossible. <laughs> I've been lied to. Yeah. I've been lied to. Okay, stick around later. 
if it was available. I want to see if it's done. We can do it on a Microsoft Paint file. Anyways, um, good. Oh, what are some other good back pocket activities I have? Um, sometimes it sounds bad, but you're in a dire situation here. I literally open an Among Us code and they all play Among Us together. The game where, yeah, everyone is Among Us, right? Um, they're so into it, they just take out their phones and they're into that. Um, again, back pocket activities are not about um, necessarily making it educational all the time. It's about buying yourself enough time until you get that lesson plan, I'll say. A few other good ones um, is a magic number. If anyone's heard of magic number, you draw a random object on the board and you say, what number is this object represent? And then you cross your hands. And if you have like, if you cross your hands like this, you can see that I'm holding four fingers up. That's the magic number is four. And they have to guess what the magic number is for each random object that has nothing to do with the object that you drew on the board. Um, and it has to do with how many fingers you're holding up when you cross your arms after drawing each object on the board. Good for PJs. That's, those are just some to get you started, I'll say. Um, Emma said, or Emma Lynn says, do you find it best to accept an OT position or hold off for an LTO? Uh, great question, Emma Lynn. You have to get an OT first before you can get an LTO except during extenuated COVID times. So the fact that if you're on OT, if you have an OT position, um, that's the only way to eventually, traditionally speaking, get to that LTO. So there's, there's no way to like hold off for an LTO. Um, once they come, just apply to them. And if nothing happens, you still got your OT. Another question for you. Um, I'm just curious, what is it? I know like we are learning a lot about like our um, different like uh, philosophy, like our teaching philosophies. Yeah. Um, we're doing belief statements and all this type of stuff I'm sure you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, when you go into an interview, what do you recommend we bring with us? Like what should be, what should we have to present ourselves with um, to kind of sell ourselves aside from what we're providing through our uh, interview questions? A good question. Um, I know some people talk about portfolios to bring. Uh, I think that's more of a PJ thing and I'm so sorry, but I'm not a PJ. So I can't touch on that. Um, I have not brought a portfolio into any one of my interviews and they've still gone pretty well. For your philosophy statement, um, here, here's a phone. It all depends on how the OT interview is set up. Um, and I just signed, I've signed a few non-disclosure agreements saying that I'm not allowed to talk about some LT or some OT interviews that I've already had. So I want to be careful of legality, especially when I'm talking to over 200 people. Um, but definitely have some sort of way to present yourself as a teacher through a mission statement or, or sorry, philosophy, your teaching philosophy all in one. That's usually, it suits well for why you want to work at the school board. That's a fun way to insert that question into your interview, I'd say. Um, there are ways to insert it into pretty much every single other question that is on there too. So that's... Sorry, something. would that be the same too? Um, would, I know with like interviews for other jobs, you don't necessarily bring your references at, up front, mm -hmm. like you wait for them to request that. Do you bring references or like um, testimonials that you have from principals or from like different teachers, like your ATs you've worked with? Is that something you bring with you? Oh my gosh, great question. Uh, I didn't show you my, my resume and I told you I would. So yeah, so I have all my references at the bottom part of my, um, at the bottom part of my resume right here. And that's the way I would recommend doing it. Um, I will say there are some boards that will say, bring a separate sheet that has references on it, but they will always explicitly tell you whether or not to bring your references or not. But no matter what, on your resume, put all of your ATs that you've had at the bottom of them definitely do that. Uh, a lot of different boards will have a separate form for you to sign before you even start the interview where you put all the, your ATs that you've had thus far. And not even references, they only look for ATs. You can have a completely separate reference, they only want your ATs for an OT interview. So keep that in mind. Awesome, thank you. No worries. So yeah, just prepare for these questions the best thing you can. I wouldn't too worry too much about bringing in external stuff. Uh, and yeah, just to let you know what my resume looks like, you have your education up there. You can have a few bullet points of some of your qualifications if you like. I've seen some people do that. 
So have your student teaching practical experiences here. Highlight, bold some words, uh, underline some stuff. Looks good. Um, say what you participated in extracurricularly. Well, you can't do that now because of COVID. But if you could do that, uh, like I said before, I have a related experiences thing here, and then I have a work experiences thing here. Mine's four pages long. And I have awards and accomplishments at the end, um, and then the references there, essentially. Um, okay, back to the questions. Someone asked if there's animosity towards teachers who get an OT and then progress to a more stable position in a short time frame. That's a good question too. Not usually. We're all pretty supportive of each other. I think when, when we all get interviews. Um, I think if it's inter for OTs, no, I think everyone's very supportive of each other, whether who gets it or who doesn't get it, because it's not really, you're not really competing against each other specifically for a substitute teaching position one day. You're all kind of OTs in it together. I think the animosity might happen a little bit with a specific LTO position. Sorry, my lights, it, sun's setting. I'm just gonna turn on the light, I'll be right back. Just so y'all can see me a bit better. Um, if so you're I, fighting. I apologize, I asked the question. I mean more in reference to uh, administration. Like let's say you get hired on right. for a position uh, and then you work there, but then you know it's kind of like another thing has come up and you are kind of in your own career oriented goals that position's better and then you're moving on. Is there, you know, that bad light or bad will kind of to get a job and then move on from it? No, no. Administration is very, very supportive of your career and what you're looking forward to. So even furthermore to add on to your question, Andrew, um, if you get them as a reference and then you move on to another school or if you have a better position that comes up, they're very grateful to even hold that reference onto you and they want you to succeed and go into another position. They can hire a new person, it's not a problem. At least, again, this is my experience right now in my limited time because this is my first year right out of teacher's college, right? So I can't speak for whether that's 100% true. Um, yeah, Caitlin, do you want to keep? Yeah, I think that's <laughs> easier scrolling? probably. Um, yeah, than me scrolling for sure. <laughs> would you be given information to contact the department head if there is no lesson plan or do you just ask other teachers? So I think if you're an OT, that's what we're referring to. Um, Department Ed, in my experience, is the best person to contact, but calling, calling anyone, I would say call the office of your department as well, because more likely someone's on prep too, and they're more likely to respond to that. Um, I would say if no one's responding from different teachers within your department, then I would say call administration, um, because it, you're, it's impossible to teach an entire lesson without a lesson plan. Um, anyone who says otherwise, it's, it's just not realistic. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Okay, um, the next question is, could you elaborate more on internal hires? How does it work? How would you get an interview for one? Great question. Um, I can only speak on Upper Grand just because that's the only board that I've been on this far, but they have an entire portal essentially in which um, all of your grading goes in, all of your uh, IEPs go in all the different resources that your school board has uh, within that internal portal. Um, it has all your HR information too. Within that internal portal, uh, you essentially just click on one tab and you and you just review it every given week and see if they posted something else and um, they format it as such. I'm gonna potentially show you one. Keep going with questions and I can bring one up to show you as an okay. example. What are some things, oh. What are some things we can do now to make ourselves stand out? So for example, being on ESC or a student council. Oh, but shout out to ESC, I miss, I miss these days. Um, good ways to stand out. When it's possible, obviously asterisk when it's possible, um, do extracurriculars. Um, if you put extracurriculars on this section of your student teaching or your practicums in your resume and you like highlight them or underline them or bold them or do something, um, that's what they look for. And that's what I think associate teachers look for as well when they're looking to give you a good evaluation. Are you going above and beyond within your own school to just do more than teach? Uh, that's how you get a good reference. And in turn, that's how, you know, some 
principals or administrators would then look to see your practicum evaluation and saw that you did go the extra step further. Um, so my number one would definitely, and again, this is such a bad answer because we're in a pandemic right now and it's impossible to do extracurriculars. Um, but ESC is obviously a fantastic one. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna give you the bit foggy answer, but any, anything showing that you're going above and beyond is, is going to just really, really set yourself apart. Um, just to answer the previous person's question, this is just what my internal portal looks like right now. Um, we call it my UG cloud. These are my different headings. And then I go to, you can see all the, my different supports here. And then I would go to employment opportunities and they would post LTO interviews right here within this. I have to log in. So yeah, you can go on to your next question. This is just where I'll, they all post my internal thing for my board. So someone said that a faculty member told them it's not common to be hired at multiple boards. Um, and then this question pertains to like the Catholic and the public board. So do you think acting as an OT for both boards would be an issue? Uh, nope, I wouldn't advertise it to every person that you meet that you're in both that you're in multiple boards. Obviously, I, it's not looking good for me as a person who's in multiple boards myself. Um, I did teach my practicums in the Catholic board just because that's the only place they could put me, even though I'm not Catholic. But um, don't advertise it, but it shouldn't be too, too much of an issue. Um, and as a, there's no way for them to really know that specifically as well. I mean, it is on your resume. They don't, they don't care too, too much, I would say. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about it, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Um, so someone asked, if you didn't have a great experience with an AT, do you think you should include them as a reference? Oh, great question. I had, my second practicum was a very bad experience myself. Um, I will say this, you have four practicum experiences. They will ask for a maximum of three references from your OTs. If you got a bad one, just leave that one out and that will help you with your entire hiring process. Um, that's a little hard if they start interviewing before your fourth practicum is finished, which sometimes is the case, but they do a lot of hiring after your fourth practicum is finished. Um, I did have one or two boards actually where you could have external people as your references, but most of them want um, associate teachers. I'm going to say you're stuck. There's nothing you can really do. If they only want your associate teacher, associate teachers to call, that's all you can really do. I would just put maybe the one that you had a bad experience with last. That's, that's my best words of advice for you. Okay, are references from the school board that you are applying to more valuable than references from other school boards? Ah, great question. I did all my practicums at Waterloo Region District School Board and I am not working there right now. I mean, I'm hired as an OT there, but I actually didn't get my job at my first Waterloo Region interview. They did, uh, they did not take me. But then my second interview a year later when I did it with them, they did take me. Um, no, no, I'm gonna say no. I think, no, because you're, you're mostly dealing with um, principals and a lot of your principals are a principal that's external from even, even other schools. So it would be once in a blue moon opportunity for um, a school that you're applying to specifically know the principal of someone that you worked with Maybe that gives you a good connection there. Like, aha, you worked with that person. That's, that's good. But it didn't happen with me. Um, so you'd have to get lucky in order for that principal to specifically know the teachers that were your associate teacher, I would say. Yeah. Um, so do you have any examples of extracurriculars you can do during the pandemic that would look good on your resume? God, that's a tough question. Um, you know what? On your, when you're on your practicums, at least in my school, there are a ton of virtual clubs that we're in. Take advantage of those virtual clubs when you're on your practicums. Um, they started them up again. Maybe if you didn't see them in your first practicum, they're definitely feeling a lot more comfortable setting up virtual clubs now. Um, I'm getting involved myself in a social justice and equity club. Fantastic. You just meet virtually and talk about social justice and equity issues within your school. Um, there, I joined a GSA, Gay Straight Alliance, myself personally. Great, talk with students and other teachers that are like-minded in the LGBTQ community. Um, that are, that's, that's fantastic as well. 
uh, take a look when you're on your next practicum, there should be some extracurriculars that are virtual that you can still get involved with, I'd say. Um, others, other than that, outside your school, I just don't know what's going on right now. I don't have any myself personally. Yeah, sorry. And to add on to that, um, do you include extracurriculars from your undergrad on your resume or? Yep. Uh, it's much farther down my list. It's not something that I prioritize on my first page. It's on my third page. Um, yeah, that's just my personal reference. They don't, again, like I said before, they really don't look at your resume that much. They want to know your answers to the questions specifically. They want to hear the buzzwords. That's the number one thing they're looking for when they're hiring you. And then someone just wanted clarification. So for internal hires, do you need to be a member of the board? Um, for internal hires as an LTO specifically? Uh, my two part answer to that is if it's a COVID specific job, nope. If it's a traditional LTO position, yes, they will not hire someone externally. You have to be the OT first there and then hire as an LTO. Okay. So would you suggest getting a reference letter from your AT or would the board that's hiring you contact them directly? Great question as well. Um, I've had one board actually ask for a reference letter from an AT. The rest just reach out to them directly. So take that as you will. Um, yeah, so you don't, I would say it's not a priority to get a specific reference letter from an AT. Um, it's nice to put quotes, pull quotes from evaluations, put them into a cover letter. That's what I did. Um, but it's rare, I would say, for a board in an OT interview to specifically ask for a written reference from the OT. Uh, more likely than not, they'll just call them up and just ask them and talk them on the phone. Is this a good person? Did they have a good experience with them? That's what they do. So a few people wanted to know about AQs, like how long it took, when did you do them, which ones you took, stuff like that. My number one word of advice for you, do not take two AQs in a row, at the same time rather. I took two AQs at the same time and I almost died. Um, I took one of them at Queens, one of them at Western. Queens works you a lot harder than Western does, I'll say. Um, if you're doing extra teachables that you're adding on, those are, which is your ABQs most likely, uh, I would look at the definition between AQ and ABQ. ABQ is going to be the actual teachables that you're adding onto your, on, onto your OCT. Those are a ton of work, okay? Ton, a ton of work, but choose ones that will make you potentially more employable and make sure the ones that you actually want to teach as well. Um, number two, ones that are like spec ed part one or ESL part one, great. Not as much work as a whole ABQ would be. Um, really, really good. You're gonna get, if you're really looking to, there's two kinds of people. The one that actually wanna learn, actually want to um, gain some information from learning, like you want to be a spec ed teacher, so you're going to take spec ed, then I would take it from, sorry, oh God, I don't want to say bad things. I'll say this, Queens is a very good university that has a lot of good stuff to offer, as does Oise. Um, make sure to do your homework, I'd say, but if you're just looking to get a check mark on your box to make yourself more employable, choose something that's cheap. Do your homework, do some shopping for ABQs, okay? Okay, so do you know anyone who has done the emergency supply that happened during COVID? Are they regarded any differently among teachers and this person specifically talking about OTs that are open to teacher candidates? Really good question. So I think you may have seen this in the news as well. Stephen Lecce, conservative government, has just lifted the ban on saying we're now so desperate for teachers that we're taking on teacher candidates from other schools and other external positions. I know people who aren't even in teachers college that have gotten hired for external substitute positions as an uh, emergency OT. That's how desperate they are, one. Two, since the, so yeah, I know a ton of them and they all have great experiences and they love it. Um, I, I would highly recommend doing it, especially because number two, it's now safer to, now that the conservative government has put this legislation forward. Before it was dangerous, they were saying, because you were not covered by your union if something bad were to happen which could potentially go on your record when you do eventually get your OCT, which doesn't look good. Um, but now you technically should be covered under a union with this new conservative law that was just put forward. So I recommend it.
absolutely get some good teaching experience and it's good money too. Would you suggest we get references from principals of the school we do placements at? Oh my God, that would set you light years ahead. If you can do that, do it. Um, get a VP to sit in on a class that you're teaching in your practicum. That will prepare you. Hey, to the other question, if, if you're worried about putting an AT as a reference, you can absolutely sub that AT as a reference with a vice principal or a principal. It's usually the VPs. It's usually VPs that do them. Principals don't do um, sit in in your class and evaluate you. Just the VPs. Um, yes, do it. Do it 100% because it's going to set you up for success in your OTs application and definitely in your LTU application because it's hard to get three administrative references. So start early. Okay, when did you, when should we apply for jobs after graduating? In April or do we wait till September? Oh, do it ASAP as soon as possible. I started applying, uh, when, when was I doing interviews? That story that I had with the Upper Grand at Toronto where the York girl snaked me, um, that was November of my second year at Teachers College. So I wasn't even into the new year yet. Uh, start as early as you can. I would recommend doing that. Be an eager beaver. Um, they hire all throughout, and that depends on the board. Different boards hire, and I didn't even, I wasn't even allowed obviously to teach until after I got my OCT, but they were just like, once they hired me, they were just like, OCT pending. Whenever you get that OCT, then you're good to go. So start as early as possible. Have you heard anything about what the interview process is like for teaching abroad? Uh, no, I have not, unfortunately. I don't have much to say on that. My apologies. Most of the people that I know have not taught abroad for two reasons. One, because it's dangerous, and two, because it's so easy to get a teaching position in Ontario now that there's less incentive to go abroad. So I would just reach out to those companies in particular that do those international um, opportunities, and they're looking for people all the time too. So they're, they'd be happy to talk to you. So try that. I'm not sure if you would know this because I think you're high school, right? But someone asked if you know if there's GSAs at the elementary level. Good question. Uh, all IS students do have to, or at least most of them should do a placement in at least seven, eight. So I was in an elementary school for my second placement. Um, they have less extracurriculars and that's tough. I had I have not heard of a GSA, but also they kept throwing me in Catholic schools, which is less likely to have a GSA. I'm sorry, I don't want to get political right now. Um, it's tough, but all elementary schools should have extracurricular opportunities still nonetheless. The ones that I worked at, they had quite a few. And um, you know what? If you're feeling daring, why don't you start one? Start one yourself. They'd love to see that kind of initiative. Okay. Someone asked, how much do AQs or ABQs add to your pay? Oh, that's a whole can of worms. I will try to summarize this as quickly as possible. One, get a Quaco evaluation as soon as you get your OCT. Quaco is the association that evaluates your transcripts and evaluates what AQs you've taken and sorts you into your A1, A2, A3, A4, which will determine how much you're getting paid, okay? Um, once you get that, they will also send you an email of what's the fastest way to get to A4, which is the most you can get paid. There's a number of ways you can do that. You can take five AQs. Um, you can have a bunch of extra credits from your undergrad that can add to it. Um, you can get uh, ABQ part one, part two, part three. If you get the part two, part one, part two, part three, that should get you to A4. If you have a master's, that should get you to A4. There's one other way that I'm forgetting right now, but they will email you specifically the best way to get to A4. Thank you, Kristalana, uh, for the Quaker website. Definitely take a look. They're closed right now uh, just because of lockdown before, but you can't apply to them anyway until you get your OCT, okay? Um, so someone sort of sent a job link, but they said, would you suggest applying if we would not be viewed with disdain by the teachers? Sorry, that was me. That was about the um, the positions that are open to teacher candidates. Uh, definitely apply to those. Uh, there is no disdain. Um, we're happy to get all the help we can get, and the emergency OTs 
some friends that I have that are still in their undergrad, not even in teacher's college that have done that position, we accept them with open arms. And they're honestly, they sub so much with us now that they're part of our school community. There's Just no all of the posting that you sent is looking specifically for students graduating um, spring 2021. So I don't know if we would be. Yeah, that's why I was. I think um, I was asked to apply for the emergency OT list directly by the principal from my um, placement school. So I'm not sure if there, if that's open for everyone in, at least in Waterloo right now, I'm, I, that's what I'm familiar with. Yeah, each board's gonna be different and have different specificities and have different needs for their emergency supplies. Uh, so just because it's so specific to different boards, I can't give you a well-encompassing answer there. Um, I know Upper Grand, they're desperate. So if you like to teach in Guelph or surrounding area, um, um, take a look what, at that. Sorry, from what I've heard, the temporary certificate that they're allowing is only for year two teacher candidates oh, who will have graduated the, pro like graduated the program by December 2021. So, Crystal, I know you're in first year, you're in some of my classes, so I don't think that applies to us. Sorry, everyone, if I'm giving wrong information. I will say that my board in particular, Upper Grand, they're breaking all the rules. Uh, <laughs> they're hiring people that aren't even finished their undergrads right now, and they're hiring people that aren't even teachers. Some of them not, don't even have undergrads. So, take a look at external resources. But it sounds like what Stephen Lecce offered in particular that Rochelle's talking about, thank you for correcting me. Uh, unfortunately, that would just be for your two candidates then. Thank, by the way, everyone's saying thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. If you have to go, you have to go, but I'm here to answer questions. So every single one of your questions is answered here, okay? Is there a website that provides all of this information for pay grade, job application processes, stuff like that? Uh, pay grade will be, I can I think you. you can find all of that on the teacher candidate website, right? Or it like directs you to different web pages? Um, potentially, I, I don't know. I haven't gone on the Teach Candidate website in a while because I don't go there anymore. But if anyone has the answer to that, for sure. I just Google Ontario teacher pay grid. I'll, sh I'll share my screen right now. And they are for board specific ones. I'm just going to the TDSB one right now just because, um, but it's the same for pretty much every single board. And you scroll down to the latest one. I could share my screen now. So you can just get a good example of what it is. So you can see this is kind of how it's set up. So you start year zero. Um, if you have certain experiences teaching related, you let Quaco know and you get a certification. Like I taught at a summer camp, a science summer camp for a couple years. Um, that gave me a year of experience. So now instead of starting at year zero, I'm starting at year one. So I start at year one now because of that extra education experience that I have. If you have a regular four-year bachelor's, you will automatically start at category A3. And then the other ways that I mentioned before, I've had to bump up to A4. That's how you get to A4. And then once you get to 10 years teaching, that's your max salary. But it does increase one or 2% with inflation based on whatever our contract will be. Okay, do you know if having your ECE counts as an AQ? I'm going to say no right now, but I do not know. So please don't take that at my word. I apologize. I don't have the information on that. Okay. Um, Contact Quico. Quico will know. Ask them. Email them. Just go to their website. They will email you back. I think that's all of the questions. Other people have like answered questions in the chat as well. So appreciate everyone answering questions in the chat too. We're all in this together. I love it. I have one quick question, sorry. Uh, did you say you're gonna email the presentation to us or how can we get a copy of this? I will email it to Abhishek and Caitlin and if they have a way to distribute to everyone else, is that possible, Caitlin? Yeah, I think I, I've been recording it anyway, so I think I just have to upload it somewhere. Yep. I'll look into that though. Excellent, thank you. Good call. I'm glad everyone enjoyed themselves. I'm glad I could offer this for everyone. Oh, sorry, one, one last question. Um, the, oh, sorry, there's two. Where can we find the application for the emergency supply? And then people are asking if they have more questions and want to chat, are you okay if like they email you? 
Yeah, for sure. hundred percent for the last question there. I'll even throw my email down in the chat as well for people to email me. Um, for the application for the emergency supply, that's going to be board specific, I'll say. So um, the one for, I think, Waterloo is up in the chat a bit. Yeah, I'm on the emergency supply list for Waterloo um, for elementary, and I got a letter from uh, the principal from my first placement asking if I could join it just because they needed um, people. So it depends on your board, but he said that the two ways were either going through HR for your board or getting a letter from that principal. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Um, so I threw my email in the chat. Um, feel free to, that's my board email. Feel free to um, contact me with any more questions you have. I will keep staying. You guys want to chill and talk? I got a few private messages as well. So if you sent those and you want me to answer those from way back when, I'd be happy to answer those too. Um, I'd have to scroll up a lot in the chat, but um, thank you so much for everyone coming here. If want, everyone wants to talk to Ryan about his London District Catholic School Board emergency stuff, you can talk to him there in the chat too. You're very welcome, Lexi. Colin, when you were, you were just talking about that, or you showed that Quaco chart before, and you were yeah. saying that you started at step one because you had taught um, like a science summer camp. Mm -hmm. What, like, how would you know what step you start at? Like what teaching experience would determine what step you're at? Great question, Paula. Uh, and this is a pretty spicy answer I have for you too. Um, you're going to contact Quaco and you're going to ask them, hey, I've done, like also for me, this is what I'm in the process of doing too. I'm going to say, I worked at a pharmaceutical company for a year. Does that help me teach grade 12 biology that's really molecular biology based? And it's as specific as that. And they'll say, yeah, I accept that. And they'll literally, based on how long you work there, move you up there. And they do it on a judgment by judgment, like case by case basis. You plead your case to them. You say, this is what I did. This is how it relates to education. This is how it's going to help me teach in my future. And they'll say, yeah, I buy that. Or no, it doesn't really apply to what you're doing right now in your position. They'll move you down if you're teaching a different subject, if that experience doesn't apply to what you're teaching right now. So in my experience, if I was teaching grade 12 biology, but then I was no longer teaching it for a year, they'll bump me down because I didn't now the experience that I had before to teach grade 12 biology now no longer applies to the subjects that I'm teaching right now. So they'll literally move you up and down the Quaco pay grid, that case by case basis specifically. Um, so yeah, go on Quaco's website, uh, get in contact with them and say, hey, does this count? And then they'll say, yeah, please give me a specific certificate. Not, not a, sometimes it'll be a certificate. They just need proof that you worked there and that you did what they said they did. And then your employer there will send that to Quaco or you will send that to Quaco um, as like a middleman. Um, and they'll say, yeah, that checks out. And that's how they'll move you up. They're the people that are in charge of that. Okay, so I would just call them and like, like if I've worked as an occupational therapist for 10 years, I can just kind of relate all of those experiences to teaching and ask, like ask them, I guess, just for every single job I've worked and, and detail that. And then they will tell me yes or no. Like what I ask. Here's also another good thing they backlog your pay. So let's say you got your Quaco evaluation in January, but you've been working since September. They'll literally backlog your pay. All the pay that you should have gotten starting from September, you'll get in a lump sum in your next paycheck, which is phenomenal. Thank you so much for that information. No worries. Hi, Colin. I'm wondering if you can briefly explain the difference between the A1, A2, A3, A4. Let's share my screen again so I can give you a little bit more specific detail, Alyssa. Um, thank you. No worries. So this is the 2019 one. This is just the first one I can find. Like, okay, fine. Um, I'm sure there's a 2021 one and this goes obviously with inflation. We know that our current contract right now, our pay increases 1% each year now. So that would be adjusted uh, for 2021, obviously, or 2020, I guess for now, because it updates every August 31st. So. Um, if you have no teaching experience, no paid, no paid experience relating to the subjects you're teaching, that's the way I'm going to phrase it because you can plead to Quaco a lot of wacky things. Uh, 
and you have a four-year bachelor's, let's say, and you submit your Quaco right in at uh, A3, or sorry, you submit your Quaco right when you get your OCT, and they get back to you, let's say, in August before you start your first OT position in September, you will start right here at A3 step zero, and your paycheck will be reflected as such. If you were to work an entire year um, as uh, an OT, or, and you're saying you're working every single day, this is, you, you, you break up this amount of money per year as such, not including like summer school. So if you have a certain experience that could potentially relate to teaching and you've, you've pleaded your case to Quaco and you've sent in proof that you worked there and your work has signed off on it and Quaco has signed off that, yes, you indeed did work there and yes, it relates to your teaching, they will bump you up how many years of experience you did that or how many years Quaco will accept because they will accept a certain number of years. And then you will start potentially at step four, A3. Next, you're gonna to wanna to get some AQs. If you already have a master's, congratulations, you're already in A4. If you have five AQs, congratulations, you're now in A4. If you have a whole bunch of extra undergrad courses combined with maybe one or two AQs, congratulations, you're in A4. If you've done a part one, part two, part three, AQ, congratulations, you're in A4. And also, oh, the biggest one, obviously, duh, if you get your honors specialist, you're in A4. But you have to be been teaching for a couple years in the subject that is your first teachable or that you're specialized in teaching with. Uh, and then you take the one single AQ that is your honor specialist that will be grant you to A4. By the way, if you take your honor specialist, I've heard, I've not taken mine yet because I've, I'm, I'm a new teacher, but it's the most useful AQ you can take. It's the one that most teachers relevantly use in their day-to-day -day life. So honor specialist AQ, keep that in your back pocket, even if you're already in A4, it's most useful. Does that answer your question, Alyssa? Yeah, it does. Thank you very much. No worries. Colin, it's Abby here. I, I had a question. Hi. And, I mean, this is great. I wish there were more year twos here, but I, I got a couple of OT interviews coming up, Colin. I, I got one for a couple of boards, but I'm, I, I wanted to understand your thinking with regards to, uh, thanks, Colin. But like, how do, you, how do you decide which board to eventually take? I mean, I don't have family and I, I can move around. So... How do you know which board works for you best? And how did you make that decision for the oh, other board? Good question, Abby. Good question. Thank you for saying that. Um, oh God, I don't, I don't know how much information to tell you my, from my specific yeah. experience because it's very personal to me, uh, just with my own relationships, with my family, how I, how I eventually chose to be where I was. Um, fun fact, I live in London right now and I commute from London to Guelph every single day because I thought I was going to stay in London um, and teach in London and stay with TVDSB. And I thought that was my number one choice. Yeah. Uh, but then I got this, some personal stuff in my life happened and I said, uh, made me reevaluate whether I should stay in London. And then also I got this LTO position from Upper Grand. And I was like, well, I got no LTO. I'm definitely gonna move to the board that's gonna offer me the LTO. Mm -hmm. But it also ended up working out that I do I do love Guelph right now and I do love this board and the city works for me. You have to think about what your, what your needs are specifically yourself. I know I like a busier city. So I, remote boards such as Avon Maitland that I'm with right now, probably not gonna work for me. I'm probably not gonna work a day for them even though I got a job with them. Um, so know what kind of life you like best. Um, how important is it you to work every single day? If you're gonna choose TDSB, even in a pandemic, when they're desperate for teachers, I don't think you're going to be working every single day as an OT. The cost of living is high there. I do love Toronto. I love Toronto with all my heart. But there's some, there's some stuff against that. There's too many teachers that they hire there. Um, Guelph is kind of the perfect little middle ground for me because I, like, I still like a city, but um, I still have a lot of opportunities to teach in a city. And um, there's a lot of employment the farther away you move from Toronto is just the general rule there. Um, so that's what worked for me. I go to where the jobs are still mm -hmm. my number one perspective because I have a car because I can move. I'm going to, I'm going to travel. I don't, the kill, the commute's killer. I'm commuting an hour and 40 minutes a day from uh, London to Guelph. It's tough, but it's so worth it because it's my dream job. I love teaching. And as soon as I finish that hour and 40 minute drive, I'm so ready to teach, I'm so ready to go, and I love my students, and I wouldn't trade my position for the world, even with the ridiculous commute that I have right now. And I'm probably gonna move to Guelph 
or the KW region once this year is up because just from the personal stuff that happened in my life and the employment opportunities that are available for me right now, Upper Graham School Board is the place for me to be right now. Yeah, that's, that's actually really helpful, Colin, because my lease is ending and I'm thinking about like, do I take another lease until I get, I don't even have a job offer yet, how do I figure? But then it's interesting that you say you'll make the commute. So I guess you just have to be flexible. And Colin, just a follow-up question. When you do get an OT, do you just go supply everywhere possible? Is that going to work in your favor or are you just, you're selective with what schools you go to when you're strategic about how you take that forward? Yeah, that's a good question too. So I don't have much experience in this because I got the LTO right away. So mm -hmm. I gave a lot of OT experience to you, but I've never actually worked an OT day in my life since I started my LTO at the beginning of September. So um, my, my strategy was going into September before I got my LTO, because I got my LTO mid-September, right when school started, like after I already moved to London and everything. I thought I was gonna be OTing for the first half of September before I got this. I was like, I'm gonna OT at the places that are close to me. So I don't have to commute as far. So I'm gonna be accepting calls from them. I realized that calls were coming in plentifully. All my friends that are in TVDSB right now, uh, they're, half of them are in LTOs right now already. Half of them are um, OTing every single day if they choose to. Um, that's how in demand it is right now. So for me, I would make the decision and say, hey, I'm close to where I'm living right now. I'm gonna take most of my calls from a school board that will employ me every single day. I know I'm gonna get consistent calls um, in a place that's close to me, so my commute's not too, too far. Um, those are my top two, I would say. But then you have to think about your future now. You have to think about far in advance of, is this a city that I really wanna live in? Um, I, I really like London. It's just not for me right now, or not for me anymore. Um, sorry to any London lovers out there, but you have to make that decision for yourself, right? Uh, is this a city that you want to settle down in? You have to start thinking about that now, because once you take an LTO, you're you're now kind of locked into that school board a little bit. Because if you're gonna want to work for another school board now for the rest of your career, well, you got to start from scratch. You got to start OTing and then make your way up the OT, LTO ladder again. So. Put your, it sucks because it's hard to switch school boards after you've already committed to one school board. So you kind of have to also make that decision for yourself um, early on to, and I hate the format of that too, because you can get married and you have to now move to where your partner is. And then you have to start an entirely new school board. And maybe you had a contract position a couple years into working at one school board, but you got to move to another city now and you have to start another school and you have to start from scratch and that's tough and i feel really bad for the people for in their life that they have to start a whole new experience with now but okay. um those are the things that you have to consider awesome thanks colin and great presentation again thank you so much abby i really appreciate it and i miss you and everyone at uh, esc dearly okay any other questions i see the chat has been lit still anything that i've missed i have one oh, sorry go ahead if you just want to ask questions yeah, Thank you. Um, I was just saying, so I'm in PJ and I know that you had talked about um, taking ABQs or AQs, I can't remember which one you had said, um, mm -hmm. to bump up your teachables. Mm -hmm. I don't have a teachable. So is there a way to bump up to like JI even without a teachable? Uh, there is an intermediate teachable in and of itself. It is called the intermediate teachable. And so having that, I could then... Um, move up to teach JI if I wanted with Correct. that. You could theoretically okay. teach up to grade 10 if you want. Oh. No, no JI teaches grade 9 or grade 10. Not, not ones that I know. Um, you'd be probably most likely able to teach up to grade 7 or 8. Okay. Legally, you can teach up to grade 10 then. Yeah. Um, to go off of that as well, if you want to add teachables and you have to do like undergrad courses to like make yourself mm -hmm. eligible to take them, yeah. They count towards AFE hours. I've gotten confirmation from um, the like education office. So if you want to do those this summer, they count. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Emmeline. That's very useful information. Appreciate it. Hey, Colin. Uh, I'll go Nav first. I think I heard his voice first. All right. Thank you. Uh, quick question. So you said you started applying for jobs while you were still starting second year, right? Oh yeah, I started like I started like looking in September essentially. So like, what did you have on your resume at that time? Uh, let's pull it up. Let's see what I had. I saved each resume that I have. I had by that point I'd taken two. Um, I'd taken two. 
uh, practicums. That's what we're looking for, practicums. Okay. So I have both practicums on there. I've had every single position that I've worked here up until the point. So like I have, I worked at, uh, sorry, I went to my undergrad at University of Waterloo. So I did a lot of um, co-op, I did a co-op program. So I had a lot of job experience also after my undergrad and a lot of my stuff is there. Let's see, September 2019 is what I'm looking for here. Uh, let's go, let's go July 2019, see what it has. I'll share my screen. So I had, oh, what the heck? I shouldn't have had my third uh, experience on here. So, but I, I essentially, I like to put my, um, uh, go away with resume assistant, my undergrad second, and obviously my bachelor's of education first. Also, side note, always call it in an interview, a uh, bachelor, uh, or faculty of education, never call it teacher's college. Um, I have my teacher's experience there, so my practicums that I had. I like to put what classes I taught as bullet points for my, um, for uh, all the practicums that I had. So like, hey, in this one I taught um, two different grade 11 university level chemistry classes and one grade nine applied science class. And what units I did, that's probably overkill, you probably don't need to do that. Um, Implemented growing success and learning for all goals. Those two documents, read them front to back, sleep with them under your pillow at night. They're the most important documents you will ever read in teacher's college and the most important documents you will ever need to get hired. Um, so implement, implement some for as and of learning, give some pedagogical buzzwords in there for what you were focusing on in that practicum in particular, stuff like that. Uh, for, for my third practicum in particular, I was really interested in assessment. So I, I like really focused on trying different types of assessment. Like I focused on observations and conversations as a part of the triangulation of assessment. And I could talk about that. And then I also like to talk about all the extracurriculars that I was a part of in that school too. So I was like part of the concert choir. I led the songwriting club. I started a songwriting club with the music teacher, stuff like that. Um, then I put my related experiences down. So shout out to Abby. This is my position at ESE last year. I organized conference week last year. The position that Abby's doing now. Shout out to Abby, you did an amazing job this year. Um, talked about just positions that are related to teaching. So this is the position that I did. That was a science summer camp at that time that I was doing. Um, different ESC positions, stuff that's related to teaching. And then this is like a lot of my work experiences that I had um, in my undergrad. So I talked about um, different pharmaceutical companies that I worked at. I was a product development engineer at a startup company. Uh, stuff like that. It's less important, right? They really don't care about that, but I put it on there anyways. Um, that awards accomplishment, any references at the end that they can refer back to, and yeah, stuff like that. Does that answer your Perfect. question? Yeah, thank you. No worries. Hi, Colin. I was just curious about uh, the experience that you said that Quaker would take into account. Do you know of any one that's used like um, university teaching experiences as part of their experience, teaching experience. Are you, are you talking about like a TA? Yeah, like if you were a TA for a number of years, would that count? With a shot, uh, I would say so. I would, I would accept it. Um, I don't know anyone that has bargained that and used it before in my own experience, but okay. um, it checks out for me. Like you're literally teaching classes that are relevant to your teachables probably, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it out for me, and it's definitely worth um, asking Quaco and, and saying, hey, this is my experience that I've worked for here. I've made money from this. Sign off on this. Does this count towards moving me up the pay grid? And they'll let you know. Right. And another question that I had is some instructors have told us to get uh, the Google Educator cert Certification. And mm -hmm. your experience is that like really valuable in applying? I don't think if you threw that on, I don't think administrators look for that. Okay. When they're looking f when they're going through um, your application or going through the interview. Like I said before, it's the interview itself that they mm -hmm. really skew and less so your actual resume and cover letter and stuff. Um, but I would say if you to do that for your actual teaching, it's super useful because the amount that school boards use Google Classroom and Google right. Drive and Google Forms, like, if you can be a master at Google Suite, you're going to 
have a good time as a teacher. And if you're not, you're gonna have a bad time, especially in a pandemic, especially with virtual learning. You need to know your way around Google Classroom and all the different Google tech it has to offer, uh, like the back of your hand. Um, it's so important. Okay, thank you. No problem, Alejandra, glad I can help out. Any other questions? Um, I'm gonna take a look at the chat here. If you want to speak up, you can do so. Otherwise, I'll just scroll through the chat. Some stuff on Quaco, super easily navigatable. If you move provinces, do these year levels apply? Oh, Caitlin, great question. I'm going to tell you an anecdote of my friend Elliot, who I work with right now. Elliot graduated Alt House in 2011. Uh, he is now 33, and um, he worked in Alberta. 2011, zero jobs in teaching. It was the worst time to be a teacher. So we moved to Alberta for seven years and he taught in Alberta for seven years. And um, he taught all sorts of different classes related to his teachables, had a great time. He was in remote rural Alberta and was like, hey, it's 2020, let's try to move back home and see if I can get hired. He did, he now works at the same school I'm at and he's now year seven on that Quaco grid. They accepted every single one of his years and now he's there. So, yeah, if you move provinces, the levels still apply. Thumbs up to you as well. Um, I'm PJ, is there a way to remember you saying ABQs? Yes, the, so yeah, if you're, also if you're in PJ or JI, I know there's not more specific teachable things for you. Um, there's still like spec ed part one, there's still ESL, there's a, a bajillion AQs that you can take. Um, there are so many that they keep offering every single year that are available for everyone. Like, there's, there's no limit to... My one vice principal that I work with right now, I checked on her OCT, she has 22 AQs. Yes, I can speak more on AQs, Alyssa. What would you like to know? Uh, I can tell you my experience with my two AQs that I took. Colin? Last Yep. Before you jump into AQs, I just wanted to touch back on the moving provinces question. Yes, for sure. Um, so if you move provinces, your years count, but if you move school boards, your years don't count. <laughs> if we're talking about, no, no, I'm just trying to understand your question. Uh, if we're talking about, school talking about money. Yes, if you're talking about the money transfers, but your seniority doesn't. Yes, that's exactly the differentiation, Emily. That's exactly it. So. Your Quaco level, let's say you worked four years at one board and now you're moving to another board. Mm -hmm. If you get an LTO at that new board now, you're gonna, you're gonna keep all of those experience years that you taught. What I said, you have to start from scratch. I meant what Emily just said on a seniority basis. So you have to start as an OT. You can't just like jump in as a full-time contract teaching position uh, anymore um, from one board to another. You have to start OT. And here's the other thing. Here's the kicker too, though, to get to your point, Rochelle. You are not a three... Oh, God, I should have explained this to people earlier. Oh, <laughs> sh uh, this is a big caveat. You are actually not an A3 until you're an LTO. You start uh, A1 year zero for all your OT jobs. Oh, God, I can't believe I didn't mention that earlier. My bad. Once you get your LTO, then you get that A3 or A4. Sorry. So... Okay, so for example, if you're starting in, let's say, London School Board, yep. London District School Board, Public Board, and you've worked there for four years, yep. and now you're moving to Toronto District School Board, you have to start as an OT, but then once you get to an LTO position, that's when your four years will come back in? Correct. So like your four years experience will come back in? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, good call. Good call there. So just to add on to what you're saying, just to add another caveat into the scenario that you're proposing. Um, here's, here's the other bummer. Here's the wild thing that I, I don't understand about Quaco. Your random, maybe occupational therapy job that you had counts towards your teaching. Yes, they'll totally take that. You know what they don't take? They don't take substitute teaching. If you are an OT for like two years, that does not count to Quaco. That's unbelievable to me. 
your LTOs or your contract positions, those will count waking right up the grid. But if you're an OT, not only do you only start at A, category A, step zero, until you get an LTO, also they don't count towards what Quaco would then move you up. You have to wait until you get an LTO or a contract position to have those years count to move up the grid, which is bull crap. Is I'm allowed to say that? That's not cool. I don't like that at all. Um, so you gotta skedaddle into that LTO quickly if you can. Um, yeah. So does that mean that we start at year zero, even though you had mentioned that if we had an undergrad, it would be four years? Yes. So we start, at stand, like we start at A year zero once we graduate. Or your OT position, yes. But everything that I said previously will take into account as soon as you get that first LTO. So all of our like summer camp positions and all that, that only gets counted once we get our LTO? Damn. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. I'm really sorry about that. The reason why I'm so scatterbrained about this is because I just started right off the bat as an LTO and I didn't, I haven't taught an OT position in my life yet. Uh, I probably will. This LTO will definitely expire one day. Um, and this is a COVID specific LTO too. I'm doing a lot of co-teaching with a lot of other teachers. So, um, but technically it still counts under the LTO umbrella, right? Oh God. Yeah. No, occasional teachers, they do not get treated well, unfortunately, but my silver lining to you is this is the best chance to get into teaching and oh my goodness are people filling up into LTO positions quickly straight out of teacher's college. It is not hard to find a position, especially if you're PJ. More positions are PJs, I will say that. Sorry, I asked. I will say Do you know if French has any like if that affects it in any way, like if you're a French teacher, does it change anything in terms of, I guess, I'm going to say pay scale and LTO positions. Like I know that I've heard in the past that if you have French, you'll automatically get an ATO right now, at least um, just because they're lacking so many French teachers. But in terms of like pay scale, does that, does that change? Does it, like having a major because I have a major in French from my undergrad mm -hmm. and then I'm in the French specialty now at the faculty of ed so does that change anything um no unfortunately not uh it's the paid position specifically that they're looking for I will say it will change it, the only thing that, that that really helps you out with is the fact that if you want you will also get an LTO just like that and school boards will be groveling at your knees because you have French um so your undergrad in particular, depending on if you take an extra courses, um, regardless of what subject they are, they, those can sometimes get you closer to A4, I will say. Um, but sorry, yeah, French specific stuff, I haven't heard. I, I'm, I've talked with many, many French teachers now at my school and I haven't heard of anything that was such of them applying through Quaco. They've gone through the same process as me. Um, okay. Thank you. Just, just know that if you want, you don't have to OT a day in your life and you will get that LTO just like that. <laughs> okay. I don't, okay, don't want to obviously put false hope into anyone's, anyone's mind right now. Anything can change, especially in the global pandemic. A lot of those caveats, change is happening everywhere. Who knows what the world will look like by the time you guys graduate, but this is just what the situation looks like right now for us. Glad I can throw that caveat in there because I don't want to give people false hope. Yes. Uh, yes, go ahead. So I know you're talking about masters. Ooh, yes. Um, does it matter what masters you take? Because I know there's a theory based and then the thesis based. Does it matter or no? The only masters that they don't count is Oise Masters of Teaching degrees from University of Toronto. Huh. Okay. <laughs> I, get, I, I get a huge kick out of that. Theory-based or course-based or research-based masters all count towards your movement to A4. Okay, thank you. No worries. Sorry, I just wanted to have a little bit of a jab at U of T there for a second. They get masters of teachings. They're all special. Well, 
no, I love U of T. I love U of T. They're a fantastic school. You don't have to lie. It's okay. Okay. I am, I'm representing Western right now, and I want to make sure I'm putting everyone in a good light. Sorry, one more question. Um, yep. You said taking two class, like two AQs, but like you did one ABQ. Would it have been easier if you had just done like two AQs instead? Or no, you just wouldn't recommend doing two at the same time? I won't recommend doing two at the same time because of the workload that it put on me. Um, I was pulling like just 12 hour nights on the regular. Um, I would say the ABQ courses do have more content for you to get through. The fact that I did two ABQs for my senior chemistry and my senior business, that definitely added to it. If you were to do two AQs like Spec Ed Part 1 and um, let's say ESL Part 1, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but I'm going to say on average, that's probably going to be less work than doing two ABQs. So that's something to think about. If you're doing two AQs during the summertime where you might not have, um, you might have a lot of time, like this past summer, a, a ton of people did Spec Ed Part 1 and, and ESL, especially in our first lockdown because they didn't have anything else to do. And they were totally fine taking those two AQs at the same time, but we were also not doing anything in lockdown. So, you know, it's very situational based. Just keep in mind of what you're, what you're hoping for uh, to achieve what your workload is and what's on your plate. It's very situational to yourself, but I can tell you the context of those kind of courses and what you're looking for. So Stephanie, to answer your question, I took my two ABQs this past September and they went from September to December. I took my uh, ABQ in senior chemistry through Queens. That course, I did more work in it than I did all of two years at Althaus. That is not an exaggeration. Um, <clears throat> And no, that's a little bit of an exaggeration. And then I did my one senior business through Western and that was less work, but still a lot of work. And then they both appeared, I would say they took a month turnaround after you finished the course for them to like upload the marks, submit it to OCT. And then early, I finished the courses early December and then in early January, they appeared on my OCT. When can you start taking AQs, Sarah? Good question as well. As soon as you get that sweet, sweet OCT. Here's a fun scenario for you. Here's a fun scenario for you. You might not get your OCT until like July-ish, you know, when they're processing it, let's say, um, at the latest. I didn't hear of anyone getting it later than that. Actually, I've heard some cases, so watch out. Some people, their OCTs get delayed a whole bunch. You can take an AQ so long as you have your OCT by the time that AQ finishes. So here's a scenario for you. Um, you've applied to get your OCT. It's, you know, your end, it's early May now. And you say, I'm going to start an AQ and I'm going to take my chances. You can do that. And let's say you do the entire AQ but your OCT has been backlogged and you don't get your OCT until like September, let's say it happens, it's happened out there. You're not going to get that AQ credit because you don't have your OCT. So it's dangerous to apply for an AQ and have an AQ course straight out of teacher's college in the summertime. It's doable. It doesn't happen often that your OCT gets delayed, but I don't want you to like waste around 600, 700, 800 bucks on a course that might not count on your OCT because it hasn't been registered and hasn't come in yet. That's why I took mine starting in September, but some food for thought, something to consider. Oh, questions, questions, questions. Really good question, Sarah, because I had a very specific answer to it. Um, when you get AQs, do you have to update that with Quaco? Yes. So I actually have to talk to Quaco again, but they're closed right now because of the second lockdown. They just decided to close up shop completely. So when they open up again, I'm going to have to send in my transcripts again, my OCT, 15 bucks. I didn't tell you that, 15 bucks. So it's not the worst fee in the world, but in order to get that uh, call from Quaco, once you get your OCT, you do have to pay 15 bucks to them. Not the worst thing in the world. 
Um, <clears throat> so I would keep updating your Quaco until you get that A4. Take, take an AQ, who knows, maybe you had some undergrad courses that were backlogged or you, or you miscalculated and you might already be an A4. So it's good to double check, throw, throw in another application to Quaco again to see where you stand again. Am I an A4 yet? But also they'll tell you specifically how to get to A4, the fastest way to get to A4 once you submit that evaluation too. So keep that in the back of your mind. Ba, 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 ba. Difference between AQs and ABQs, Alyssa. Um, yeah, I don't want to get this wrong, but I do believe ABQs are the entire extra teachable that gets added onto your OCT, whereas regular AQ could be like spec ed part one, um, which isn't necessarily a teachable in of itself. It could be ESL. Um, and I keep using those in examples, but there's a ton of them. There's, there's reading or there's writing. There's AQ specifically on reading. Those aren't teachables in themselves, but they're really fun, interesting, and engaging AQs. But they're classified under AQs, not the ABQ, because you don't get a teachable in reading, right? I believe that's the difference between the two. Let's hear Abby's question. Are the requirements or eligibility for ABQs and AQs the same? What are the requirements to take ABQ for business? Great question, Abby. Um, ba, 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 ba. Eligibility is the same. You can take, uh, oh no, no it's not. For an ABQ, check with Aspire. Okay, so right in your back doors, everyone, you have the Aspire office here at Western. And it is run by a literal goddess. Her name is Susanna Green. She is an unbelievably incredible person to work with because you can print off your transcript or send your transcript digitally to her, have a phone conversation with her, and she goes, this course, this course, this course, this course, counts towards an extra teachable for you. Because you have to have a specific number of courses in your undergrad to add a teachable. I'm talking mostly to IS people right now here. Um, so to get an extra teachable, I believe it's two full credits or four half credits in that subject matter. And Susanna Green, God bless her soul, this woman's incredible. She knows every single undergraduate course in every single Ontario university and what that course could potentially be assigned to for an extra AQ for you. So like I had, she could differentiate between my financial econometrics course and my um, marketing economics course that I took. And she knows that my economic, my financial one counts towards an econ teachable, but my marketing one does not count towards an econ teachable. She's that good. Um, Emlyn saying, oh yeah, thank you for that. Is that true? 2.0 for 9.10? I would double check that, Emlyn, because my friend's doing a senior physics right now and he only has 2.0. But I could be wrong as well. Again, don't take my word as gospel. I will say that on this. I will let you know when I'm feeling shaky on my answer. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not completely sure that. Def, but what I do know for sure is that you best check out Susanna Green, send your transcript to her, and she will let you know which specific courses can make you eligible for that ABQ. Okay. Sorry, I just looked at the email that I was sending um, the Aspire office. And to do like a senior one, it's a 70% in 5.0 courses. Okay. Thank you, Emily. But nonetheless, still worth it to just get all your, your entire transcript checked out. And then Suzanne will tell you what specifically you're eligible for. That's the best way to do it, just to double check. But thank you, Emily. That's awesome. Um, Abby, I hope that answers your question. Are AQs generally offered in person, online, or both? Um, only online, actually. Only online. Even without COVID, only online. I haven't heard of a AQ pre-COVID times that is in person. Maybe they're out there. I'm not sure. But um, I don't even know how people did AQs back in the day. I guess you had to like go and like before technology, I don't even know. I'm thinking about it now. Yeah, only online, only online. 
And like I, I did my uh, owl, or sorry, I did my Western EQ through owl. Like it was set up an owl and everything. And if you do it through Queens, you have to set up your whole entire like bright space um, portal and everything through Queens University. And it's quite the process to do that too. So keep that in mind when you're doing an AQ at another university. Glad I can help, Alyssa. I believe I'm answered every question up until this point. Anyone here? In, oh, Abby. What advice about teaching would you give the Colin that just started Teachers College? Sorry, quite open-ended. No, I, I think this is time for the open-ended questions now. By the way, feel, people are, feel free to go. I'm just here to ramble now at this point. And sorry if I'm taking up everyone's time. <laughs> right now too, you're, you're absolutely feel free to go when you'd like. And this is recorded, obviously, too. To answer Abby's question, um, what advice about teaching would I give to myself? First of all, I would have loved one of these for myself because I had to learn everything that I'm saying to you all now, like this past September. Um, what, what advice would I give now to myself? I was worried. Like, I was so worried about not getting a job even before the pandemic even started, I was just terrified that teaching was gonna be a, a slug and I was gonna be OTing forever, still potentially possible, and we weren't gonna get jobs, but I'm, I'm just so relieved now to know that, and just even like reading through your, your magazines now that you get um, from the OCT, you can even like statistically see like how jobs are opening up for us again. Um, yeah, so I just tell myself not to worry about the future ahead. Uh, work hard. Like I've gotten OT rejections too. Like that's important for everyone to know here too. And I would say don't get too discouraged by OT rejections. Um, they're going to happen. You're not everyone's cup of tea. And there's so much to learn too. Um, also, myself starting at Teachers College, I worked a lot because I had a co-op program as well. So I had a ton of different jobs and I had a ton of different interview experience. I would also tell myself teacher, like OT interviews are nothing like the private sector interviews. They're a completely different ball game, which is why I really tailed, tailored this presentation specifically towards what an OT interview is to be like. Don't expect what are your three greatest weaknesses in, in an interview or anything related to the such. We're talking specific pedagogy related stuff. I would tell myself to read um, I would tell myself to read Growing Success and Learning for a way earlier and multiple times over. I need all y'all right here to put in some work with that, uh, with that, um, those, those two documents right there. Sorry, I'm spacing out a bit now. Um, because those two documents right there, if you can know those like the back of your hand, you're set for those interviews. You're, you're, that, those are specifically what, um, administrators, vice principals are looking for, or principals when they're interviewing you. Um, really, really, really important. Because um, they're really looking for that, that growth out of you and seeing how you're transitioning your pedagogical knowledge into practice, right? That's what they're looking for. And those documents really, really help you do that and reflect on that properly with your own PD that you're doing too. Hopefully that answers your question, Abby. Those are just the things off the top of my head. Um, Alyssa, let's see your question. It might be a weird question. When you're supplying and you're at the lowest pay, how much of that number do you actually get to take home? I've heard a lot of, well, I'm not going to show you my paycheck right now. My paycheck <laughs> for this Friday has just got emailed to me. Um, what am I going to say? Yeah, I get a huge chunk taken off. So your deductions are going to be from as follow. OSST, or your union, mine is OSSTF. They'll take a handsome chunk of change off of your, each of your um, paychecks, pay stubs. Uh, income tax is ginormous. It's probably the biggest one, obviously. <laughs> uh, third would be your pension. A lot goes to your pension, uh, which is good. It's still technically your money. You just don't get to take it home with you in that paycheck. Uh, there is a few other taxation things like GST, that kind of stuff. Um, OCT membership fee is also one of them. Yes, uh, you do pay that up front at the beginning of the year. So then for the rest of your um, paychecks after that, um, you don't have to worry about it. It's just once a year for your OCT membership fee. And the thing that sucks about that too, is it's, I think it's up now 120 bucks to register 
for the OCT and then 120 books as well on top of that to go each year to stay with the OCT. So uh, just some fun numbers there uh, that will get sliced off your paycheck too. Uh, I believe that's it. But in terms of like a proportion now, I'm trying to think of like a ratio to give you. I mean, I think you can put the numbers together by just looking at um, where I am on the grid now too, but um, it's a lot. It's like maybe a quarter of my paycheck's gone. Maybe a third. But I just have to remember that a lot of it's going to my pension and I will get it back when I'm old and wrinkly. Unions like to take a lot of chunk out. Abby, I'm so glad to do this. I really miss my time at Alt House. It was a fun time. And um, thank you so much for asking me to do this too. And, and uh, I think I'll probably end it there. I'm a little tired and I'm a little hungry for dinner, but I'll send my email in the chat one more time. Thank you so much, Colin, for your time. Oh my gosh, you're welcome. And thank you to Abby for booking Colin. <laughs> Good call. So my email's in the chat there. Um, this is the one that I check most often. It's my board email. Uh, if you have any other questions, please do not feel free or feel free to reach out to me and I'd be happy to help. So thank you so much for having me, everyone. I really appreciate it. Um, I love talking about this stuff too. So I'm like really happy to do this too. So see you later, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much, Caitlin, for moderating too. Oh, no problem. You did most of the work. You nailed it today. Oh, but I kept you on a long time too. You were supposed to do this until an hour ago. That's okay. I think I learned a lot more than I thought like I would. Like I'm really happy I like stayed the whole time. For sure. I'm glad that I can hopefully offer you some wisdom here. So good stuff. Nice. Perfect. Thank you. See you later, Caitlin. Bye-bye.